Thank you, Kyle. Um, it's actually uh, to, to speak after uh, Professor Garber on anything related to China's policy towards South Asia is kind of a humbling experience. But I'll um, I'll try my try my best to share with you uh, some some views on on China's strategic interests in India's neighborhood. China's Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road Initiative, launched by Xi Jinping in 2013, which was actually formalized as an official policy in a paper published in 2015 by the Chinese government. These two initiatives enables China to build infrastructure and economic relations across Central Asia and South Asia. And China's current economic muscles and financial schemes and instruments like the Silk Road Fund, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the Shanghai-based BRICS New Development Bank. These financial instruments enables China actually to take earlier engagement in this region to a very different level. It could very well be that the Chinese investments in the region, it certainly will bring economic prosperity, increased connectivity, and also increased stability in this region. I'm certain that we will see development along those lines. A positive contribution to, to this region. But at the same time, there is also a strategic perspective on China's increased footprint in the region. And I could have talked in length on the first aspect what this brings in, in terms of positive developments. But in this presentation, I will focus on the more strategic drivers behind China's Silk Road policy, and in that way sort of try to set the stage a little bit for, for the discussions that we will have um, later, later at the uh, conference today. In my presentation, I will focus on a few, few aspects. First of all, I will examine the role of South Asia in the larger Chinese foreign policy outlook. I think it's very important to understand where South Asia is placed within the larger Chinese foreign policy priorities. Secondly, I will look at, identify four strategic interests that China has in this region. And finally, I will look at some of the advantages, but also disadvantages for China developing the Silk Road policy, increasing its footprint in India's neighborhood. So let's start with the bigger picture. What is ac actually China's geostrategic outlook and where does South Asia fit into this? Professor Garber already alluded to this, but China's turn to the sea, adding sea power to its continental power, is actually one of the most fundamental geopolitical shifts in recent history. Then I'm not just talking about regional. This is one of the major geopolitical shifts we have seen in recent history. After the end of the Cold War, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, China had for the first time in history, for the first time in history, been free from any major land-based threats to its security. This has allowed China over the last two decades to shift its geostrategic outlook towards the sea. And in order to understand the importance of this, let me remind you that only once, only once in China's long history has China had a true maritime outlook, and that was in late Song and early Ming Dynasty. So this is the second time in China's history it has a clear maritime outlook. And China now has one of the world's largest merchant fleet. It is one of the three top shipbuilders, and in recent years it has also added naval capabilities and maritime law enforcement capabilities on top of this. 
making China today a true maritime power. And as China goes to sea and resolve the territorial disputes in the East and South China Sea have come to the forefront. And the strategic rivalry between the United States and China in East Asia has become more prominent. Since the Korean War in the early 1950s, East Asia has been characterized by Chinese domination of the East Asian mainland and US domination of the East Asian maritime theater. So although China's Navy still has limited warfighting capability beyond the near seas, increased naval capabilities does challenge the US traditional dominant sea power position in East Asia. I'm mentioning this because as the United States withdraws from Afghanistan, United States and has the United States has rebalanced towards East Asia in order to give more attention to economic possibilities as well as security challenges in East Asia. China's as the US is, is doing this, China's main overall priority today is not to fill the power vacuum left behind by the US in Afghanistan, but to secure its growing sphere of influence in the East Asian Maritime Theater. So although we are in New Delhi today, talking about China's interest in South Asia, I think it's very important also to bring with us what is actually the US top priority. And just to add a little bit on this, on the foreign trade part, China's foreign trade with Japan last year, and Japan is China's third largest trading partner after the European Union and the United States. So China's trade with Japan last year was more than twice the size of China's combined trade with Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, Iran, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. And even if we add China's trade with fellow members in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, being Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan, on top of China's trade with South Asia, it still falls short of China's trade with Japan. And even China's trade with the 10 ASEAN member states is three times larger than China's trade with South Asia. It's important to bring this, this with us. Of course, this does not mean that China does not have any strategic interests in Central or South Asia. On the contrary, I will outline four main priorities, strategic interests China has in South Asia. First, China seeks to stabilize its western frontier. Second, China wants access to energy and mineral resources. Third, China seeks to establish expanded land transit and access to the Indian Ocean for its landlocked inner provinces and as an alternative channel for its foreign trade. And finally, it is important for China to manage great power relations in its own backyard. China has traditionally been concerned with countering strategic dominance in its backyard from the three great powers, India, Russia, and the United States. And China's partnership with Pakistan has been part of this strategy. However, I think we see that China is increasingly motivated by consolidating its own influence in its backyard rather than countering other great powers' interests in its backyard. This is an important shift that perhaps doesn't come about as is very important, but it's actually a very important shift in thinking on the Chinese side. A few more details on, on, on e each, of, each of this. The Western frontier, of course, it's, it's important for, for China, and it was already from the outset after the end of the Cold War the new states being established, it was an immediate fear on the Chinese side that, that this could have some negative spillover effects into China. Of course, possible economic possibilities, but also a, a fear on the Chinese side for negative spillover effects. And this was the main motivation for establishing the Shanghai Five, which today is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. 
And this is also why China has stepped up its engagement in Afghanistan also over the last, last few years. The second strategic interest, access energy and mineral resources. China wants to tap into energy and mineral resources in this region. China is today the world's top importer of crude oil. It's the top importer of metals and minerals, and it is one of the largest gas consumers. More than half of China's oil imports originate in the Middle East and Iran. A little bit more than half, and this is, has actually been constant for the last 10, 15 years. Although China's total import of crude oil has increased tremendously over the last 10, 15 years, the share of import from the Middle East and Iran has been constant at a little bit more than 50%. This illustrates China's diversification strategy, which is very important. And Central and South Asian countries are also prominent suppliers of gas to China. And the Chinese government aims to boost natural gas share of the total energy consumption to 10% by 2020 in order to alleviate pollution. And China is expected to continue importing natural gas in the form of seaborne LNG and pipeline gas from Central Asia, from Myanmar and from Russia. And metals and minerals, Afghanistan, of course, is perhaps the most important import partner for China in the region. On the access to the Indian Ocean, it is a stated goal. Also, if you read the policy paper that was published by the Chinese government in 2015 on the Silk Road Initiative, it is a stated goal in the policy to connect China with the Indian Ocean through South Asia. Nearly 80% of China's crude oil imports and a large part of China's trade in goods traverse the Strait of Malacca. Although this maritime choke point actually constitutes only a minor, I would argue, a minor security risk for China, the Malacca dilemma continues to shape the thinking in Beijing. And this is part of the reason why China is constructed a network of roads, railways, and pipelines through Afghanistan and Pakistan, through Myanmar, through Tibet, down to Nepal and Bangladesh, that will provide China with access to the Indian Ocean. This allows for a diversification of the country's trade channels, while diffusing the risks inherent to sea lanes of communication, which, according to the Chinese thinking, are still mainly dominated, controlled by the United States. And this development on land is supported by Chinese investments in deep sea ports in Pakistan, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka. Of all the projects linked to the Silk Road Initiative, of course, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor seems the most ambitious one. And this corridor could potentially reduce China's routes for oil and gas imports from Africa and the Middle East by thousands of kilometers making Gwadar port a vital link in China's supply chain. However, in the case of a U.S.-China conflict, these alternative channels enabling China more direct access to the Indian Ocean, they would still not stop the United States from enforcing a trade embargo at China if the United States is still in control of vital sea lanes of communication. I don't foresee such a situation arising, but if it would, it would still be, although China builds a lot of connections via land, it would still be not be in control of the sea lanes. The fourth strategic interest, influence in China's backyard. China has been concerned with countering great power dominance from India, Russia, and the United States in the Central and South Asian region. A persistent feature of China's regional policy has been to prevent India from becoming a regional hegemon in South Asia, and its main tool has been a closer relationship with Pakistan. While, Indian, while China and India for a number of years have experienced strong economic growth, 
the balance is uneven, and this has bearings on the two countries' perceptions of each other. Today, China's GDP being five times larger than India's, it would seem that New Delhi has grown more concerned by China's new power than Beijing is concerned by India. China and Russia are today on better terms than ever, sharing a common skepticism of American hegemony in international affairs. While China remains wary of Russia's traditionally close links with the Central Asian states, India and Iran, China is nevertheless outgrowing Russia on all accounts and is clearly the stronger party. According to the latest IMF International Monetary Fund figures from 2015, China's GDP last year was 11 times Russia's GDP. And China's trade with Central Asian states have surpassed that of Russia's. It did so already in 2008, eight years ago. And even though Central Asia once may have been Russia's backyard, China has certainly redrawn the fences. It seems very unlikely that Russia will be able to challenge Chinese interests in Central Asia. Traditionally, China's main concern has been U.S. encirclement and to prevent China's neighbors from moving into alignment with the United States and with one another to counter China's rise. But as I mentioned already, as a result of China's increased economic and military capabilities vis-à-vis -vis India and Russia and with the U.S. leaving Afghanistan, we may have reached a point where China is becoming less concerned with countering other great powers' influence in its own backyard and more concerned with promoting and consolidating its own influence. At the very end here, I will very briefly mention a couple, two, three advantages China has promoting its interest, and then at the very end, pinpoint two, three disadvantages China has. Chinese advantages. Of course, China's economic size is an advantage, and China's well-established financial schemes supporting Chinese enterprises investing in the region. No other country has financial instruments on par with China. Second, while in East Asia, China is competing with the United States and Japan for, inf for influence, Chinese power is increasingly less contest contested in Central and South Asia. Third, China is building a strong relationship with countries in the region, with Afghanistan, with Iran, as Professor Garver mentioned, and of course China has a long relationship with Pakistan. Finally, one more advantage is that China is a member of most regional institutions and in initiatives, policy dialogues in Central and South Asia, a platform China can make use of in the region. And then at the very end of my presentation, a few points on Chinese disadvantages. One challenge is that many countries in Central and South Asia are fragile states. So although China hopes that the Silk Road Initiative will contribute to economic integration and stability, it could also be a risky strategy for China. Another related challenge is that with an increased presence and large-scale investments, China will no longer be able to keep a low profile in the region. And China mine, might find itself entangled in disputes that would be a new experience for Chinese interests in the region. Furthermore, China's Overwhelming influence of its states, of the smaller states in the region, may incite suspicion, anti-Chinese sentiments, and a wish to balance China's influence by developing closer relationships with other countries. Now, of course, India would certainly like to be 
an alternative partner for countries in the region. Central Asian states have already, you can already identify some concern in Central Asian states about large Chinese presence. And this could, of course, also be the situation in, in South Asia. Finally, New Delhi may be exaggerating the China threat, but Beijing also runs the risk of underestimating Indian concerns about China. And both types of misperceptions may lead to miscalculations. If China ventures too far into India's perceived sphere of influence, it might force India to improve and strengthen its ties with other great powers, the United States, Russia, and Japan. And that is the very thing we will discuss at today's conference. Thank you.